Hi everyone, so first things first, I have a new microphone right here, so it's a clip-on microphone. Um, it's from Rode, so I'm trying this one out from, from a friend of mine, because I got some comments about bad sound quality, and I'm just trying to improve this channel every day, so I'm trying this one out now. If you like the sound better how it is right now, just leave a thumbs up so I know I should buy one and uh, improve the videos that way. So I'll be talking a bit more about the last two videos and give like a small presentation about pre prick and the use and why I think it's useful, why it's not, how to use it, how to store it and so on. There will be in the downside of this video, there will be uh, a colored theme by every topic I talk about. So if you want to skip some parts, you can just move um, the, the little timeline to the spots you like or rewatch it again if you want. So, so I have a little presentation on my computer here. I prepared it quite quickly just to give me some notes. So sometimes I'll be re reading off this just to be able to give you all the information that I think is useful. So I'll start with the beginning of the video with talking about the storage of pre -break. So it's Prepreg ha already has a resin in it and it will cure if it's not properly uh, stored. So it should be stored in a freezer. And uh, the reason for that, it's just in a mechanical or chemical way, is just to avoid the resin to start from curing. So it's the same with regular resins. Uh, you're mixing A and B and at a certain temperature it will, it will start to kick in and have a chemical reaction and um, make it go hard. So uh, in the freezer you can like stretch that timeline to about one year and that's what they call the shelf life. And the funny thing is it's not like it's not laying in a shelf uh, but it's just in the freezer and there are two ways to store it. So you have your conventional freezer so if you're a mom or a wife or whoever who owns a freezer is okay with you storing the pre-break in it, you can store it into a regular uh, household freezer. Uh, for bigger rolls, um, the suggestion is to have like a chest freezer. Um, when you're in like hot countries, they have these freezers or in most shops to store vegetables, um, pizzas and so on. But you can also buy one of these and store full rolls of pre-break in that. So you have about one year um, in the freezer be before it starts to deteriorate. And if you're like the cool thing about the XC110, I don't know about other pre pregs but mostly you will have in between like 15 till 30 days of shelf life without having it being into a freezer. So um, that's a bit about the, um, the how to store it. And I'll just show you my freezer and how it's organized and how I keep everything um, into my freezer. So here you have it. So this is the freezer. I keep most of my pre-break in. So uh, I'll just show you how it looks like. So it's all in compartments uh, with different types of pre-break. Um, so I have the XT110 as well. So this is the tooling pre prick but this will be for another video. Um, it's from Easy Composites as well, just to make the molds out of a pre prick uh, system. Um, so I have different rolls in different sizes, and this is the um, the tooling pre prick And how I know the difference is because of the brown uh, paper layer on the back, and I'll also label everything. So I have. Uh, two meters of 38 centimeters um, of width on uh, 210. So this is the XC110, uh, 210 grams square meter. And I started it on the 11th of 0818. So just, just to know uh, when everything is stored and I always use the first resin. So the other cool thing is you can store um, like I have a layer of 210 when I'm just making tutorial or if I have to use a bit more uh, on flanges and so on. So I store them uh, that way. And these are like little, little packages of um, the offcuts that I use to make like the patchwork uh, tutorial uh, of the second little car I did in the last tutorial. Um, and then what do you have here as well? 
just some templates I did for a customer. And then right here we can see the example of a, a chest freezer uh, where you can store um, full rolls. So the easy composite rolls are 1.25 meters long. So um, that way you can store them in here. But most of my uh, rolls are stored in a small freezer. So here's the thing I'm going to explain how you can see that the shelf life was passed. So um, these were stored not into the freezer, I think about two months. And you can see it's like, it's very crispy and it's even brittle. Um, but the most important thing is like to know for people that don't know much about pre-break is that um, this is not like a way you could say, I am going to make pre-break parts, put them into a mold and just put them, I would say like, six months uh, on the side and then have good parts because you need to have like the temperature to let the resin flow and uh, get it all out into all the um, all to the spots and tightly against the mold so the second thing that you will see is that you will lose all tackiness into your fabric so if you're laying it into into a mold you want that tackiness just to be perfect just to be able to put it into all corners and get it to stick to the mold as well. So um, this is like the, the crispy sounds that I wanted to explain. So um, if you remove the backing layer, you will see it's like this is cured resin. So you're not able to use this anymore. So that's why it's so important to store it into a freezer if you're sure not to use it within the 28 till 30 days after uh, having it sent. So a bit more about how the pre prick is called. Like I'll be using the Easy Composites pre prick as an example, but it should be like for most pre pricks you can buy online uh, or in a shop somewhere. So uh, the Easy Composites pre prick is called like for the out of autoclave, so it's very important to mention that it's out of autoclave and not autoclave pre prick They also have the, the autoclave pre prick but I'll talk a bit more about that later on. So you have the x prick XC110, so the C stands for components pre prick They also have the XT110, I think, and then it's for the tooling. So if you want to make parts, use the component. If you want to make tooling, like the molds, use the XT110. So then they call it pre break carbon 3K. So the 3K stands for uh, 3,000 strands, uh, like fibers per strand. The higher that is, the more compact the weave will be. So you have like the, my favorite um, carbon fiber for infusion is for example, the 650 12K. So it's a very dense um, strand into the weave. So, um, Quite important to know that a 3K is like the regular um, thing for a, a twill weave, for example. So then it's a 210 gram. So the 210 gram stands for the weight of the fiber. So that's very important. It's the weight of the fiber without the epoxy resin. So the uh, pre prick resin being into it. Then it's a two by two twill. So that means how it's woven, so it goes two times under and two times above the other strands. You also have plain weave, for example, but they don't sell plain weave so far on, uh, on their website. And then very important to know, it's um, 1,250 millimeters in width, so on a one meter roll. So if you order, um, like the price is set on the website, I think it's around 53 pounds. It's for one meter long, on one meter 25. So it's um, very important to know because it's not the price per square meter, but on a roll of 1.25 in width. Um, and then they also have the x prec XC110. It's a 6K, 416. There's a big difference to know between these two that I'll explain a bit later on. Um, but so it's a 416 and it's a 6K. So it has double amount of strands or fibers into each strand so it's a very it's a more compact weave and it looks very similar um, it's hard to notice the difference between uh, these two um, but you can always weigh it or you just you can feel it in your hands if you have layer a and b but mostly it will be a backing layer 
uh, that way. So it's also 1.25 uh, centimeters uh, meters long uh, in width on one meter long. So you can buy, I think, on one meter rolls, two meter rolls, five, ten, or full rolls. I think a full roll is 100 meters. Um, but very important to know is so the on the XC 110, 210 grams, uh, you get uh, a fiber to re uh, resin ratio of 100 on 42. So there's 42% of resin onto the fibers, meaning you have a total weight of 362 grams in total on that 210. Um, and here's the important thing is on the backing layer, you only have a 38% resin ratio. So it's not as resin rich as the, like they call it the surface ply, I think, or the uh, first ply. Um, and that's because it, you have more resin into that first ply. So if you're making a mold, I would highly recommend you to do a first layer of 210 for better results and to, uh, like for a surface finish, so to avoid pinholes um, and things like that. So the 416 grams has a total weight of 693 grams um, in total. So if you want to make calculations for a customer, for example, in advance and say part A would weigh that much if you do it in that way or that layup, it would weigh that much, like approximately. And that's the advantage of pre-break. You can calculate it pretty precisely uh, in comparison to infusion. If you're not um, like that familiar with the process, it can be very difficult to calculate or give an estimation. Um, just to give you a rough idea, um, I get ratios of 37% uh, of resin on uh, 63 of fibers into a good resin infusion. So it's not always the case that pre prec will be a lighter part, uh, but mostly the resin re will result in stronger parts. Uh, but I'll explain that later on uh, into this video as well. And then you have like the big difference between out of autoclave and autoclave. So as long as you're not building like Formula One pieces, spa spacecraft, um, big planes, uh, out of autoclave should be enough. There's just a minor difference between um, like, as far as I know, uh, I could be wrong, uh, write it down in, in the comments if you're in that um, sector of uh, spacecraft, aircraft and so on. But mostly the parts will be quite identical in mechanical properties, maybe not that much in mechanical properties because you have more compression. So you're working on minus one bar under vacuum for an out of autoclave, and you can go up to 10 bars, uh, positive pressure plus uh, the uh, vacuum negative pressure. So they put, there is a gas into a big chamber and they put a lot of pressure onto the bag and then you, as well, you can suck out all the air out of the part as well. So you get a more compact um, stack of uh, layers with an autoclave. So that's why it's better. And here's the last little tip about using the pre brake from Easy Composites is that you have, when you get it chipped, you will have a brown, um, in fact, you could call it the backing layer. Um, but if you're making parts and you want good results, I also said it into the video you should use the brown side, so when you remove it, as the first layer um, into your mold. So the brown side is onto the surface of the mold when you remove the, the brown side, of course, because it's a bit more tacky and it's a bit more resin rich than the blue side. So. Um, that's maybe something important to notice if you're looking for that last like 2% of better results. So um, that's about this little topic about the difference and the pre prec uh, Easy Composites is selling. So here's another thing I wanted to mention. So um, I just have a few of this laying around. Um, so this was, if you've been a customer from Easy Composites for a long time, you will know that the pre prec previously was sold as um, Vari Prec. So it's another system they improved now with the new X Prec. So this was the old one and this was the surface ply. So this is already a bit um, out of shelf life. 
And this is how it worked previously. So you had the, um, this was the first layer and then you do the backing with the, uh, it was as well, I think a 250 and a 450 grams. Um, but you apply this as a first layer into the mold and it has a dry backing surface. And this improved the surface finish because you have a resin rich um, layer uh, into your mold. The big difference is, so what's the big improvement with the new uh, x -Brec? is that it's more clear. And just to show you how much clearer it is like into the, uh, the resin, I have these two examples. So um, this was done with uh, the x -Brec. And this is the YouTube buttons you might know about, uh, I did in, the, uh, in other videos. Um, I'll just show you in a close up what the big difference is into the clarity. So both pieces were made um, and then sanded and I've just added the first layer of clear coat. Uh, this is not perfectly finished yet because there will still be uh, a mold being made of this. So I'll sand it back and polish it up just to get a good surface finish. Um, but here's the difference. So um, it might be hard to show you on camera, um, but this is a bit more dull and the fibers are not that nice as you can find here. So um, that's a big improvement on the, on the cosmetic side of the x prag compared to the easy prag they had before. So um, that's a bit of the difference. So both of these have been clear coated just to make it clear. Uh, you can get them out of the mold perfectly if you have the same surface, but mostly I just sand the pieces again and then just add a layer of clear coat to get that like that deep shine and uh, the weave popping out of the parts. So throughout the years, I've been trying a lot of different types of molds. Uh, pre brick can be pretty challenging to get like the right mold. So I'll be going through like the no-go's and like go to the more optimal, the best molds you can make to be, to be getting like the perfect pre brick parts like you want to have. So um, I'll start with the first no-go. It's um, Silicon, so as long as it's, it's uh, high temperature resistance in some ways, so you can find silicons that are high uh, temperature resistance, it's just too flexible. If you're adding um, the vacuum on it, it will just flex and give you bad results. So um, that's not a good idea to go for. Then you have like, obviously, um, this is polystyrene. So this, and in fact, it's, it's a funny thing because I've, I've already started thinking about doing a tutorial between the difference of polyurethane and polystyrene. Most of you will already know um, what to use it for and what not, but I'll keep that like a, a little thing to, uh, to make another video from. Um, but this is a no-go because it's not high temperature resistance, resistance and it's mostly too soft. So, um, and polyurethane is also like, um, it's strange to say, but it's, it's a sweaty material. So it's leaves some oils on high temperatures and it causes some problems while um, making parts on high temperatures, temperatures due to that, like the, the polyurethane uh, sweating uh, a bit. So it's strange to say, but um, there are ways to get around this uh, just to get like pre prepreg parts. Uh, you just have to be creative in some way, just to think about like mid steps before getting to the right molds. Like for example, you can go from a, a polyurethane to a mold looking like this, that is not high temperature resistant. But if you're a bit creative and you think about it, like in the last video we did with the, um, with the mold we made here, with the tooling, epoxy, uh, gel coats and high temperature um, epoxy as well on the back. You can go from a non-high temperature resistant mold to a high resistant mold by post curing this one and making pre break parts out of this. Or you can even make an XT110, so the tooling pre break uh, positive mold again from this one and go back to a negative mold with the tooling pre break So sometimes it's just a matter of thinking a bit, uh, being creative, and you can always get to a mold um, that is pre break um, resistance or accepts the pre break and high temperatures, you just have to be a bit creative. So to go down the list, we have the, the polyester resin molds. So these, um, 
these won't work with prepreg because of the temperature. And um, the big problem with the temperature is that polyester will go to around 50, 60 degrees before, before deforming. So this is with the chop strands on the back. So this is not ideal. You can always try, but mostly you'll get bad results or the mold won't be strong enough to resist multiple pulls out of your mold. So this is a bit of the same. That this is with a regular, um, so a fiberglass mat with regular epoxy, but the same problem. The uh, laminating epoxy, for example, from Easy Composites is not compatible to high temperatures. So you're not able to go till 120 degrees. So that's a no-go as well. Um, but we have like around the same system, but if you use high temperature resistant um, epoxies, you're able to make molds to get the pre-break out. So that's a solution you can go around with. Then you had the Unimold system from Easy Composite. So while they were selling the Easy Prec and Vari Prec, they were selling these type of molds as the go-to to get like the high temperatures. So you can pass cure the Unimold system that you can see right here. So it consists of the tooling gel coats, then a backing layer of uh, coupling coat. I think it's a vinyl ester with the tooling resin on top. So you get a, a strong thick mold without too much shrink. So that's a big positive thing about making molds by this system. And then you can just pass cure it till, I think it's around 110. So the Vari Preg was used to cure at around 100 degrees. So these molds were pretty okay with it. But with the new system, like curing at 120 degrees, it gets more difficult. So you have to go to new solutions, which is the tooling epoxy that I used in the tutorial. You can go for, um, this is the casting, I think it's aluminum filled or it's something like that. So it's just resin you can pour and pass cure. So this was done for the YouTube button. If you want to step up the game, but like mostly uh, aluminum molds, so these were for a customer. Um, the big problem is it's very expensive and they have another um, a different expansion rate. So if you're making like a tube, it might be that the aluminum is expanding and while cooling down, it shrinks again and your part just gets stuck, gets stuck in between of the tube. Um, the advantage as well is that it will expand a bit more shrink again and if you have a positive part you can hear it into the oven it's it's a very funny thing to do um, while curing and cooling down again um, the mold shrinks and you hear your parts popping or making like nose noises uh, of the parts coming loose um, so the problem about that is that the shrinkage can cause some surface uh, problems so pinholes or cracks or voids so uh, that might be a problem. So the solution to that is using pre prick molds because they have the same expansion and contract contraction rate. So um, that way you're able to have like good parts. The only problem with the pre prick is, is that it, ha it has no gel coat. So if you sand it, you will see like a weave into your part. But mostly in my case, um, I just sand the parts again and then clear coat in clear coat them before you go to a customer because mostly I make cosmetic parts or um, parts that will be used in a mechanical way, but then you can just sand them again and polish them and get a good result. So um, that's the solution. And that's also like the solution for the cars we did here. What you could do is, this is now uh, accepting 120 degrees. So you can make a negative mold uh, from this part now and get like good pre brick molds to make more parts like these out. And then yeah, you have like the ultimate solution. It's the tooling pre prick from Easy Composites. So it looks like that. You have a black surface that is into the pre prick So it's a gel coat, so you get a perfect finish. You can sand it like just a little bit and polish it as well, just a little bit. But mostly it will give better results than the regular pre prick And on the back you can see as well, it's all pre prick um, and you can hear it on the, so on the sound 
it's like it's a, a compact mold. It's a very good mold. So um, the only downside is it's a bit more expensive. Oh, and just forgot this one. It was laying on the back of the of the table, so I didn't see it. So this is the CNC millable epoxy tooling block. So that's a good solution. Where would I place it? I would place it in between the um, epoxy high temperature resin and the pre-prick molds. Uh, just to get like your first uh, good mold from and then continue making parts uh, with the pre-prick. So now that we know all of this and if you're new to pre-prick and you're interested into pre-prick and want to start making parts like I do in the tutorials, uh, what are some solutions just like to get a hang of it, just to know if it will work or not? I mostly work with like easy samples you can find around. So um, here's an example. These are, I think, IKEA balls. Um, so cereal balls or just for vegetables or fruit salads and so on. And they are from aluminium. So the good thing is you can try testing a new pre-break or a new material on these. So that's also how I work. So when the new X-Break was released, I just started with making some samples. So um, these are very easy to do before starting with new molds. You can, buy, you can buy like 10 of these and just do different layups, different systems, different curing. And that's how I learned like to get the good results out of this uh, new pre-break system. So um, that's an idea. Uh, you can also try it with um, steel or aluminum L profiles. Um, of course, like what I always tell when I get some comments on Facebook and so on, like people say, I want to try pre prick uh, I want to do a boat, I want to make some, like mostly something very complex. Then I always say like, try it first on a regular plate of glass, because this is like, you can have almost no contamination. You can try like different materials, like is your re release agent working or not? Because I always use, the chemical release agent from Easy Composites, but some people don't have access to it. So mostly I just tell them, take a piece of glass. You can mostly find it in more store in most stores. Try your re release agents, try your oven, try your curing cycles on a, piece of, on a piece of glass, because this is like the most easy thing to try. It doesn't take too much time to do the layup. And you know, if, if the resin is okay, if the system is okay, and uh, the pre-break. So that's also for me like something, if I notice that something is going wrong on multiple parts um, while trying the pre-break, um, and I'm just like, I'm losing it. So I don't know, is it, is it me? Is it a wrong pro process? Is it a wrong system with the oven curing? I try it on a piece of glass next to a part. And that way I always know like a reference on a piece of glass. And I know like, um, is there a problem with the material? Is it outdated? Was it badly manufactured or not? And I try a glass plate and if the glass plate is perfect, but the part is not, I know it's not the pre-break, it's not the curing cycle, it's not the release agent, it's not the bag, it's probably something else like the curing or the molds not being compatible with the pre-break. So that's how I excluded many problems out of, uh, of trying the new pre-break. Um, then you also have like, this is something probably most people already have at home. So this is the, um, it's to make sand hot sandwiches. So hot toasts with, uh, with ham and cheese. And, uh, um, I try this as well as a mold after going for a glass plate, or if I'm doing like a workshop or a tutorial, uh, with people. I just tell them, try it on this. It's a bit more complex than uh, a glass plate. Uh, it's a bit more challenging and um, you'll get like easy results just prepping the molds with chemical release agents and then you can just go and try. And so um, these are results like while making samples, uh, I try it on these. Um, and then of course you can make your own molds like I did here. Um, I'll see like maybe some people are already interested in buying a mold like this. Maybe I can start doing something with easy composites. If I make the molds, I sell you the molds with the amount of material needed. Uh, but it's just something to figure out with easy composites if they are 
ready for it, if they want to do it or not. Uh, leave a comment below if you would be interested in like a, a kit package with the molds and the amount of pre-break needed just to make it like your first pieces and following my tutorials. Um, and if you're new to pre-break and so on, Easy Composites also sells kits. Uh, it's for a very good price, I think, it's okay. Um, you get one meter of pre-preg, uh, 210, one meter of 450 grams. You get the perforate release film, vacuum bag, pre cloth, vacuum bag and gum tape, so the tacky tape, a true bag connector, uh, the valve, so the entire thing to make the, um, the vacuum connector. And then you get some gloves uh, and the pump is op uh, optional. So uh, they also have the professional kits, but mostly if you're already into pre-preg, uh, you don't need that box of extra gloves and uh, maybe a vacuum pump and, and so on. So um, if you want to try it, uh, you can always uh, go for a kit first before buying like 10 meters of pre-preg uh, and not knowing where to store them or don't having the oven uh, and so on. But these are some things I'll talk about, about negative points and positive points I think about pre-break. So I'll start with the negative points and then go to the positive points. Um, so a few of these like negative points or things that I think you might need to know is that pre-break pre will look easy. So um, in my videos, I just try to do it like a time-lapse going all the way through the process, um, making like these cars, um, like I didn't do them before, so for me it was a challenge as well. It worked out perfectly, but it was quite difficult to get it into the tight corners, into one, um, one mat of pre-break. So as much as it might look like stickering or uh, putting vinyl wrapping onto pieces, it's a bit more difficult than it looks. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, like it's not because you're used to making molds, doing chop strands with polyester resin and so on, that you're always able to get good results from the first try. So it's mostly not giving up, keep on trying till you get the good results. And it's, it should work. It's very possible that it's, it will work, but it's many factors that will make it a good or a bad piece. And I'll talk about the possible, possible bad factors uh, later on in this video. So the second negative thing about pre-preg is that you have a limitation on your molds with the oven that you have. So the Easy Composites oven is 110 on 40 centimeters. And I think it's about, uh, I think 50 centimeters high, maybe a bit more. Um, but so you're limited to these sizes as well. So um, that's something to keep in mind. I have a second oven that is one meter on one meter on one meter 10, I think. So I'm able to make a lot of parts in that oven, but I will probably never be able to build a boat, um, an aircraft or something like that, because you need a big oven and it needs to be a very good oven. So you're not able to make parts into a wooden box with just a, uh, a hot vent, ventilator into a, into a wooden box that is insulated. Because you need that very precise temperature to be steady uh, onto one degree Celsius for a long time. Um, and having it like being a closed box against cold air going through uh, for a very long time. So uh, that's a limitation you have uh, with pre-break. Uh, the other thing is the price. So um, pre-preg can be, I would say, very expensive. So it's 53 uh, pounds for a square meter. It's a bit more because you have one meter 25. Um, but that's just for one layer. And mostly you will need like one uh, surface layer back to its multiple backing layers. So that can bring the price quite up. On the other side, um, you don't need extra resins, you don't need peel ply, you don't need a, an infusion mesh. So it's, it's something that I will talk about later on um, in probably another video where I compare pre prick to infusion or wet layup, uh, vacuum bagging and so on. Um, but it's, it can be pretty pricey, so uh, you have to store it as well. It can deteriorate, uh, you, you don't always get 
perfect results. So um, that's probably like a, a neg negative side. Um, the drapeability as well is much more complex than doing like the preparations for an infusion where you don't have the resin because the resin is like the matrix keeping everything together. So it's very close to having a sticker or a thick, a very thick final wrap. So final wrap, you're able to um, blow some hot air on it. Maybe I should do a video about it because I have some wrapping as well here in the workshop. Um, but it's more stretchy with a vinyl wrap because you're stretching the uh, polymers. And here you just have the fibers keeping everything together. So it's very difficult to drape into a difficult size. So I would say like the car that I did is probably like, I wouldn't say the most challenging piece, but these had like sharp corners, sharp edges uh, to get all tightly against the mold. So um, drapeability might be a problem with pre -prec. The advantage is you can cut them into smaller pieces, but that's for the positive size uh, later on. Um, so if you have voids or bridging, you, like I told in the beginning of the video, you have on the surface ply, you have 33% of resin. So that's very low. So if you have a void, all the resin from all the, the fibers you have will all go through that void because of the vacuum being pulled. So vacuum will always suck all the resin to a place where it has more space to uh, pull up. And, uh, and that way you get voids, you get cracks. Um, yeah, and like that's all caused to the bridging. If you're doing an infusion, the advantage is that if you have a sealed bag, all the excess resin will just pull up in that place, but you will have like a nice, um, it's not nice, but you will have like more resin into that corner and still have the perfect shape of your mold that you had. So that's a, ne a negative side as well about the pre-break. Um, then of course, it's the oven and freezer. So you have to have a big freezer to store all your pre-break. So what I do, like I've, I've um, showed you in the beginning of the video, I have a freezer, but what I do is when the pre prep arrives, um, it has already been out for four or five days with the shipping. I don't know how Easy Composites works and how fast they get it out of the freezer into um, the sending of the, the items. But when it arrives, I think it's about, about five days already out of, um, like the shelf life is already diminished by five days. So if you need to store it, uh, what I do is it arrives, it, I cut it down into um, three strips of the length that I have, mostly two meters at a time, um, roll them onto um, a tube and put them directly into the freezer. So like mostly I'm limited to 37 uh, centimeters wide of width. And um, like for, for, mo for me mostly like my oven is only 40 centimeters um, of depth. So that's mostly not the problem. Uh, if I want to go for bigger pieces for a customer, for example, I just order in time. So that's just like a manufacturer's manufacturing system. When you just, just in time, it's like what the system is called. I order, for example, five meters, it arrives, I put it directly into the mold, uh, and then I can still have my one meter 25 of width. So uh, storage might be an issue for uh, some people. Um, and then also the negative thing is with complex molds, uh, it can be very tricky to like to make the parts. And I would also say it's very unpredictable because at some points I was making like five trials uh, after each other. In my opinion, like the same layup, the same curing, and I get different results. And sometimes it's very difficult to exclude what it was. For me, what the problem was, was the molds back then. So that's what I did with the uh, uni mold. So I, I got good results, but not like the pinhole free surface that I was looking for. Then I changed the system to the uh, XT tooling pre -prec. Then I get perfect results and uh, as well with the high temperature resin uh, that I used in the tutorial previously. So these are a bit of the minor uh, neg negative sides about pre -prec. And um, we'll go through the positive sides. So I think it's um, like there, there are many positive things, uh, but it's just very difficult to list them. But the positive thing is that it's, um, it's sticky, so it sticks to the molds. 
if you're doing like infusion and so on, you can try to drape it down and then you just have to add the peel ply and then you get more and more problems. And with the, um, with the pre prick system, you don't have that problem. So um, that's one of the advantages. So second thing is it's very clean. So you can just make sure you wear gloves just to don't have contamination from your hands onto the parts. And just also to be uh, like, it's a safety measure don't have the epoxy resin on your hands. So it's very easy to work that way. A mask, I don't think it's like mostly optional because you don't have loose fibers. The resin is not curing, so it's a low uh, VOP um, system. So you don't have a lot of um, resins and um, smoke and, and things like that you get from an infusion while mixing the resin. So it's very clean and it's very easy to work with. Um, Second thing is, and it's a bit in contrast to what I say with the storage, it's very easy to store the pre prick get it out, make all the cuts, like if a customer orders 20 or 50 pieces, you can just make the cuts in advance, just put them into sealed bags, put it back into the freezer, and each day you pull out one of the bags and make like three or four parts, depending on how many molds you have, and just get it done like that way. So um, you can do all the preparation in one day, and then just go through the entire week making the parts. So another good thing is you can always pause while working with it. So the big advantage is like you can work like for a half an hour, get the first layer in, then go and grab some food, for example, and then just continue with that first mold. Another thing is you can just get the pre-break out of the freezer and work on seven several molds during one day. Then you can do another seven molds the day after, and then you can just put them all together into the oven in one time and just let them cure uh, during one day. So that's a big advantage, I think, over, for example, a wet layup, what I think is horrible, because first of all, you don't get like the best results, and secondly, it's very stressful. So you have big cups of resin uh, being mixed, then you have to work it into the mold in around, like for example, one hour, uh, or maybe even more if you have a slow curing uh, epoxy resin. But then you have to be sure just to put the bag on, get the bag fully sealed. If you're not getting fully sealed bag, you have to leave the pump running the entire night, for example. And I don't really like to put um, a vacuum pump on while not being present into that room. So that's also for me um, a bit of a problem. Like infusion is way better over that because you can also work in one day, uh, stop, at the end of the day and then just start making the vacuum bag, getting everything in a vacuum, even wait an extra day and then just go for the infusion. But the infusion can be very stressful uh, with unpredictable results like for example having a leak, um, having resin not going into the, the sites you want, uh, reaching the vacuum pump too fast and so on. And that's a problem you don't have with pre prick So that's why I love pre prick uh, for that reason. And also it's, it's an easy layup, like you just sticker it on, add the, the, um, the film in between, so the release film, just put everything under vacuum with a breather and you're done. So you can just put it into the oven and let it cure. So that's a big advantage I think as well for pre-break. So by knowing what the positive and negative sides are with pre-break, uh, the question is mostly when do you use pre prick So I'll mostly use it on small and complex parts where I really need to know uh, that everything is tightly against the mold, uh, have no bridging, have some complex uh, shapes like um, holes or bevels you have with tight corners. It's always easier to do it with pre prick because you just have the time to put everything tightly in, into the mold and make some cuts. So that brings me to the next uh, thing where I'll be using it, is if you're trying to make a V-weave, uh, so it's with the alignment of the fibers, it's much easier with pre break So that's also a reason why I would use it. Um, I would also use it mostly on more like cosmetic parts uh, if they are complex. So it's in relation to the first thing I told, um, where I need to have like the perfect piece uh, without bridging where bondo or spraying over it with a color won't be possible, that's probably where I'll, I'll be using pre -break. Um Also an important thing is, when you need to make multiple parts for a customer, 
and needs like a repetitive, it's very hard to say, <laughs> um, where you have to repeat the same process over and over again with the same layup exactly to the millimeter, for example, on, uh, on flanges, on sides, where you will have uh, nuts and bolts being connected into the parts. It's always easier with pre prick to make like the templates, get all the cutouts and put everything on exactly the same part into the mold. So that's also a reason why I'll, when or while I'll be using pre prick it's also like, obviously, um, the pre prick cures at high temperatures, so it has a higher TG, so the um, temperature it is still resistant to um, while being in use. So if you're making parts like, um, I would mostly say car parts, uh, for example, a bonnet for a car, um, if you have the size of, of an autoclave or an oven big enough, um, it's good to do it in pre prick because it will not flex, bend, have problems with higher temperatures uh, while in use. So that can also relate to small parts. For example, if you're making uh, a connector for into an oven or um, parts that will go into, may, might be strange to say, but like a tip of a hair dryer or something like that. Um, pre prick is of good use for that. Um, and last but not least, like I said in the beginning of the video, um, you might get good results with infusion as well, but with pre prick you will get stronger parts. Mostly like, I, I never did some real testing, but I can just feel it. If I do a layup of um, 200 grams, so I mean like uh, three layers of 650, or do a layup with uh, the pre prick then I'll just notice this by bending it that the resin matrix in the, in the pre-break is stronger than um, while doing an infusion with resin. Um, it's also not possible to get more resin because resin is in fact the most brittle thing into doing uh, a carbon fiber piece. So it's not like you cannot think like I told it as well, I think, while making the, the mold making video. It's not like I'll put a lot of resin on it just to make it thicker and make it stronger. It's mostly the resin that will break and then followed by the fiber being um, broken or bent as well as a result of that. So as a follow up of that as well is that temperatures do matter. So what I mean by that is it's by the side of the curing, so the curing cycle will make a difference on the, on the pre-break and the materials that you'll need. So I already explained it a bit in the mold making part, um, but it's something you really have to think of because you can make a mold uh, by using like the regular gel coat with chop strands, polyester resin and so on, by just taking a piece and just try to make it. That piece could be wood, could be any type of plastic, could be metal, could be even an already made uh, fiberglass piece. But when you're using the pre prick and you use, it, you use it into a high temperature system, like being into the oven, you need to take count of like the materials that you use for your molds. For example, you have uh, expanding polyurethane foam. Um, while being into an oven, it will expand even more. Like it could even expand one centimeter because I did some trials with expanding foam uh, as for a mold, and it just expanded like really much. So um, it was a problem using this into a high temperature environment. Um, so that can be a problem for, um, for that. Even with plastics, like some plastics go till 100 degrees, they are self-releasing like many plastics like um, um, polypropylene and so on will be self-releasing. Uh, so that can be an advantage in making parts by the irregular uh, wet layup system. But in a pre prick system, that part could just deform, first of all, under the vacuum. So it can just be crushed under vacuum. And the second thing is that it could go soft and even has some like toxic reaction uh, causing problems with your uh, release agents and um, making like a chains of error resulting into a bad piece. So um, that's 
a bit about the temperature, it's very uh, important to know of. To know of. Um, so the second thing is like there is an entire list of materials that you would be using in a normal infusion that are not possible into a pre-break uh, vacuum system like out of autoclave into the oven. Like for example, you have your connectors. If you're using um, plastic connectors or they have seals uh, that is not made from a silicon that is heat resistant, your plastic around your uh, valve will just melt and cause air leaks. Um, as well as the release agents, uh, never use a wax while making prepaid parts because the wax will just melt and it just won't have any more barrier left in between your pre-break and your mold. So you'll get with a part that is stuck onto your mold <laughs> and I don't think that's something you want. So the chemical release agents are uh, the best for pre-break, but just check your um, manufacturer's data, your, the technical data sheets, just to see if your release agent is compatible with the mold and high temperatures environments. Uh, that goes as well for your vacuum bag. Uh, some like cheaper vacuum bags will just deform, will melt uh, under high temperatures and that might cause problems. Um, another problem and that's also like a small minor thing I find about the tacky tape from Easy Composites and I'll do like a quick video uh, to illustrate what temperatures can do on, um, on different materials is that the tacky tape is like it's safe till 110 degrees uh, that's what they state on their website but it's it can be used at higher temperatures okay because till now i do all my parts with that tacky tape and it's okay the only problem is that it gets very soft and it can just be sucked by the vacuum into the bag making some holes while you have some um, like air seeping through through your bag resulting in in, in bad pieces uh, so you can also find tacky tapes that are resistant to higher temperatures. I know I'm, at this moment I'm testing one that is still 140 degrees just to see if I can exclude some problems while doing a long cure at high temperatures. Um, and then you also have, you might have problems with cheaper vacuum pumps that don't go to high temperatures because you're sucking air out that is at um, a higher temperature. So that's a problem. The breeder as well, um, you cannot use um, like an, an infusion mesh into the piece because that's mostly something that is not done but you can think about it like instead of using a breeder I'm going to use a flow mesh um, just to improve that, that vacuum around but your uh, infusion mesh will just melt into the piece so uh, that's a problem as well uh, sometimes the peel plies are not resistant to high temperatures just like your bags uh, and things like that. The second thing about the topic temperatures matter is about the curing of the pre-break. So these pre-breaks are made by having a cloth of carbon fiber and then just have a pre-mixed resin with a very, very slow um, reaction. So that's why you have 30 days before it will start reacting in some way and getting harder and harder over time. So these are mixed. And these manufacturers mostly work very hard on getting the right ratio, the right uh, flow of the resin at certain temperatures. So it's very important just to follow the manufacturer's data, but also try to experiment and improve, it, improve their data. So the Easy Composites um, curing cycle is stated as, if I know it's uh, out of my head, it's about uh, starting at 20 degrees, then you go till 70 degrees, you wait for as much as you want, so the longer you want, uh, the better the results might be. Why? Because at 70 degrees, the resin won't cure, but it will go to a very liquid state, so it will just fill the entire surface of the mold and just avoid having like dry spots and um, other problems that might be caused by having your resin not being fluid enough. So after that, you will go quite rapidly, rapidly till 120 degrees just to get everything hard and just settle the resin 
as where it was during those 70 degrees. Um, and so that's why you go until 120 degrees. It's only for one hour, one hour and a half. So other things you can try is, for example, do a curing at around 80 degrees Celsius or 90 degrees Celsius for a period of 24 hours and then maybe get better results or same results or, um, yeah, or worse. So it's very important to read the technical data sheet and just start to understand what will happen to your resin at different temperatures. That's also why I do multiple tests on glass plates just to know what's the best way, what's the best curing cycle and also what's the fastest curing cycle with good results because time is money and you want to get sometimes two runs out of your oven during one day but till what point is it acceptable to go higher in temperatures and maybe have a bit more pinholes but still be okay with the parts um, instead of having like a very very good parts without pinholes but having it into the oven for 48, 48 hours um, so it's something you have to measure out what's the best curing cycle and mostly I just follow the curing cycle they advise and then I just try different curing cycles that's also why the ramp temperature of 2 degrees Celsius per minute is very important just not to cause it to like cure too rapidly in between 70 and 120 degrees or not too slow that it will cause other problems. So um, that's a bit more about the temperatures side of pre-breaks. So here I explain you a bit what will happen to the pre -break. So this is the old uh, easy break, but with heat you will see what will happen under uh, higher temperatures as well as with the tacky tape and just a piece of plastic. So here you can see the resin is very soft now and it's bendable and it will just start to, to flow more uh, while being heated. So, but this is a bit overdated, but if I'll keep, if I keep adding heat, So if I keep adding the heat, it will just go into a liquid state. And then once it goes to one, 120 degrees, it will just be solid hard and cure nicely onto the mold. So now with the tacky tape, uh, I'll show you the difference. So here it is now. So it's bendable. It's pretty okay in its shape. And it doesn't stick too much. But if I heat it, you will see what will happen. This is, of course, at very high temperatures, but it's so soft and even burns just a little bit. But it's so soft, and if you have some vacuum pulling, you can just lose all your vacuum right here. So that's why you have some tacky tapes that are till higher temperatures. The only downside is that they are more expensive, mostly. And now for the plastic, this is very obvious. So this is like mostly like people thermoforming uh, pieces. They'll just use the heat in their advantage. But this is not something you want to happen with your 
your part where you're making a mold from. So here are some things for people who tried pre-prick and get bad results. Uh, they mostly, like they tell me, uh, hey Matthew, I tried your tutorial. Uh, your tutorial is crap, it didn't work. Um, it's just a big scam, you're lying on your videos. Uh, <laughs> so what are like mostly the causes is just the environment or the way they use a the pre-prick that is mostly like the biggest problem. So what are some problems? Outdated pre-prick, so like um, maybe it's stored badly or they bought it on eBay from a guy who just stored it into his garage for over six months. Um, and that will cause problems with the curing because like from all the facts that I stated uh, about this before in this video. So that's mostly linked to a bad pre-prick. Um, if you're buying, for example, I've seen a lot of posts on eBay selling pre-prick um, and it's just named pre-prick, but it has to be out of autoclave as long as you don't have an autoclave because it's another system of resin, it's another curing cycle, it's higher temperatures, so that's mostly a problem as well. Another thing is moist. I'll add a little video about how to remove like the pre-prick out of your freezer before using it because it will have some um, moist coming onto your package. If you're not having the pre-prick sealed, it will all go into your pre-prick. So that's a problem as well. Um, then you have problems with bridging, but then they say, oh, I didn't have problems with bridging. It was all tightly against the parts, uh, against the mold. But when you see pictures, you just know it's like a problem of bridging. Like it's mostly one of the most common problems with pre-prick or resin infusion. It's mostly bridging. Um, or you have a wrong curing cycle. You just say, um, I'll just put it into the oven on 120 degrees for one hour. Uh, I'll just skip the entire um, like build up you did with the 70 degrees, getting it a bit more fluid. If you just skip all of these steps, sometimes it can get good results. Like I said previously, you can just adjust your curing cycle for your parts, for your type of mold and just get good results and just get like better and better into the curing cycle and get the best ratio to time and good quality. But if you're just skipping all steps, that's mostly a problem as well. Um, then you have wrong molds. Like I said previously, don't use polyurethane, don't use everything with esters. So polyesters, vinyl esters, uh, gel coats with polyester might cause problems or having molds not being high temperature resistant. So another problem might be a wrong bag. If you're just using um, bags or a sheet that you bought in a DIY store, it can be it's not resistant to high temperature, it doesn't have a release um, application so it won't come off of your part, or it has like microscopic little holes, that's always a big problem. So the other thing is leaks, you cannot have any leak into your part. So I'll do probably another video about it just making uh, airtight uh, vacuum bags. It's very hard to explain because it's mostly like it's in the fingers, you know when you get a good part, you know when you do a drop test for around one or two hours that the bag is still under vacuum and is good, then you're ready to proceed to the next step because if you don't have a sealed bag, it's the same with resin infusion. I think infusion and pre-break are very close to each other. If you don't have a perfectly sealed bag, you don't even have to start with the curing or with the infusion because you know you'll get crappy results. So it's all about full vacuum, full pressure, um, especially on a pre-break and with an infusion, not getting air into your, um, into your resin or into your parts. So another thing is the wrong release agent, like I said, with the uh, mold wax or people using uh, bee wax or Vaseline or oils. Like I, I've read about using olive oil or uh, sunflower oil to make a good release. It's not, it's not possible, like you have to use the right chemical release agents. And it's mostly a thing about, um, yeah, I bought some of Easy Composites pre-break and then I bought some like 
Kevlar pre prick on eBay from a guy, and then I just put the carbon fiber pre prick first, backed by the Kevlar, um, and it doesn't work. Like it's delaminating, uh, I get a lot of air, and um, I think it's a big problem with this or that or that. Mostly it's because like the resin matrix is from different manufacturers and just have different curing cycle. Uh, they are not bonding into each other. They don't have the same chemical um, like composition. So you won't be able to get results uh, if doing so. Also, the thing is uh, the temperatures where you work in can also cause a problem, the humidity you have in the room. So it has to be a very controlled environment to get consistent results. Um, but like I said, it's something to work on. You can try um, doing it into your garage where it's 15 degrees Celsius, or you can do it at home at uh, 27 degrees Celsius, uh, or I would rather say 22 degrees, or into open air on a sunny day in the summer on 35 degrees. Um, all these factors will have different results. So it's very difficult to like be consistent in what you do if you don't have a controlled environment uh, based on hum humidity and temperatures. Because it's also a thing, if you're working without gloves, uh, your skin will have some oils. Or if you just had a sandwich and um, your hands are a bit oily, you get it into the pre prick and it will cure um, into the pre prick while curing and it will cause some fish eyeing and pinholes uh, onto your finished part. Um, as well as if, like in the beginning of the video, I explained about the perfect resin to fiber ratio. So it's measured out by the manufacturers to be like exactly good to get good parts, still be uh, lightweight. If you're using gloves and a hot air gun or a hair dryer, and you get the resin soft and it sticks to your finger, then you're always removing a bit of resin that should be used to saturate the carbon fiber. So that's also a possible problem. So I use the least amounts as possible of uh, hot air uh, to get the parts into the mold and just sticky enough. So um, these are some of the problems you might have. Uh, if you have some more examples or uh, things you think of, just write them down in the comments below and I'll see if I can do something with the comments uh, later on to make like a follow-up video or something more. So I'll explain you how to remove like a bag or roll um, out of the freezer and what you need to do before opening the bag. Because you'll see like there's still some ice um, onto the bag, but you'll see a lot of drops coming on because of the moist in the air um, landing on top of the uh, frozen bag you have here. So I'll wait for a few minutes. A big roll can take up to several hours to uh, defrost and remove all the humidity out of the air and not being stuck into the part because otherwise you will have moist into the pre prick or into the carbon fiber and that will result in pinholes and bad results. So here we're back with the, um, the parts you took out of the freezer. Of course there was some ice on it but even if it would be clean from ice, it would still have condensation on top of it. So I'll just show you, like, this is the amount of water, not only due to the, the ice, but condensation as well, that might get trapped into your, uh, your fibers. So that's a big no-go for epoxy resins because they're like not good friends. Water and ice uh, and resin aren't the best friends, so mostly resulting in pinholes or voids or um, like blurry lines into your, uh, your resin. So now I'll show you some quick tips to get better results with your pre prick parts while doing the layup and just to avoid the previous problems I talked about. So here's the first thing about avoiding bridging and it's an example I took from a video from Easy Composites as well. So um, it's very difficult to try to make something like this match um, into one sheet because this is not tacky anymore. But if it would be tacky, you would stick it here and just try to push here and it won't go into that tight corner. So 
the solution for this is just making some cuts and if you're afraid of having like bad results on your sides with pre the advantage is that you can cut it in any way without having the carbon fiber fraying too much so how would you solve this you just put this ply against the corner and then you can just have the other one being put something like this just with a bit of overlap and then you can just bend it and push it a bit further into the corner because it will be much easier to have this side only bent in into the corner instead of having a ply like this that will tack to your mold and here as well and trying to push it in and the problem will be all the resin from here so all of this which should saturate the carbon it will just all drip down into that void and fill it entirely with uh, resin resulting in bad results on everything on your part the second thing is using the right tools so um, these are dibbler tools I think it's called like that um, and that way you're able to push the carbon fiber tightly into uh, tight corners so because your fingers still have a round edge making it impossible to just like push it tightly in so you have these you can buy these or you can make these yourself um, I just think sometimes it's just better to pay a bit some money and just have the right tools instead of putting time into uh, making your own but this should work with like a, a spoon as well for example or a knife or the back of a knife so uh, you don't need to buy these but I think these are pretty good to buy so I just bought these to save me some time making my own um, and they have some like self-releasing uh, characteristics uh, on these so uh, they're just like bendable enough as well uh, just to put them into tight corners so for example here you can just apply more pressure and just push it into the corners as well you will see the fibers moving if you don't have like a compact uh, fiber alignment uh, into your part they have different thicknesses here as you can see so this is a very thin one this is a thicker one and then you have rounded edges and like a knife shape so the way you can use them is just like applying pressure like this this one is like for tighter corners um, and you can just like push it into the tight corners and then you have these and mostly what I do is just I take it here and then go like all the way around the flanges and push it tightly into the corners so I got this first question from Jonathan Wingfield about uh, the last video so in the comment section so if you have more questions write them down in uh, those comment sections of those videos so I can do a follow-up as well about using fiberglass instead of carbon fiber um, if it would result in like more print through after curing or not um, so I have to say I haven't used um, fiberglass before as a backing of the mold because like I said in the video I mostly use carbon fiber um, cut offs from projects just to make these molds um, why because it's like a stiffer mold you have to use less uh, fabric and less resin because mostly shrink will occur into your resin and not into the fiber um, so it's better to have carbon fiber because it's less um, plausible to have shrinkage into your fiber than fiberglass but normally you should be okay with using fiberglass and it's cheaper as well but you'll need more and more resin to get the same stiffness so I would advise to go for um, carbon fiber on small molds if you're making big molds then it might be most cost efficient to go with fiberglass so here's the other question from Bishoy so it's a Dutch message but if I translate it uh, he's trying to make parts for his motorcycle and just knowing how to make like edges around your parts before making the mold because like uh, it's true what he says like here the part was already fixed on a, a base plate that was flat but the way to do it is just 
you make some um, fluid boards flanges all the way around your parts. You can just seal the edges that are not perfectly um, combined or aligned with some, um, some plasticine, so the B-Wax, and then you can just make your mold based on that. So you have a mold with curved edges uh, after making the mold. So another question, I'm sorry for the first name, I just can't read it or just pronounce it rightly because I don't speak your language. And uh, Marcelo as well, asking about how the um, mold, the yellow mold was made or how to make a perfect male mold. So it's very easy to answer because the video was already made and put onto my YouTube channel, but it's been a while, so I'll just show it again. So I had these uh, shapes as a base, and then it was just put down onto a base plate, and then I made this mold, so with the mold making putty, but this is not the high temperature putty, so I do another video about it with the high temperature uh, putty, so to make pre print molds as well, um, but that's how it was done with these shapes. So um, as an answer to Bishoy, Bishoy as well, if I pronounce it well, um, I put these shapes, uh, and they were anchored down with a nail, um, onto a base plate made of wood with melamine uh, on top just to have a good release, and just built the mold around this right here. So, Pailul Dah, I don't know how to pronounce your name as well, because weird names I'm here on here. Um, so, about making tubes, I don't think pre prick is the best system. If you're making bikes and so on, then it's a good system by using it with a bladder. So it's a pressure from the inside. Um, if you're just trying to do it without a bladder, because it's a very complex uh, thing to do, you have two mold halves, you put the pre brick inside, and then you can just put a vacuum back through and close it on the sides. So that's the way you can make it. I think a better way to make tubes is, first of all, it's weird to say, but buy them online because it's cheaper to buy them. They're from like good quality. Or you can use a filament winding machine, but it's quite expensive as well. So I think your solution is to buy them. And if you want to, to make them yourself, you just buy a mandrel made out of aluminum or um, like even a PVC tube and you wrap carbon fiber around it. And that way you'll get like a good inside finish, but not a good outside finish. So um, that might give you some, some things to think about, uh, but it's, it can be done, but it's quite difficult to do. Pierre, about the knife being closed to the mold or uh, onto the mold, I do understand your concern and it's indeed something that you shouldn't do uh, into your mold. So like even making cuts into the mold, it's uh, something that I wouldn't advise. This was just, as a reference for um, making these two little molds. For me, these molds are not like the most important molds that I make. Um, but indeed, if you have just like a serious mold, a big important mold, don't use a Stanley knife or a, a razor blade into the mold or close to the mold. Um, if I'm right with the, the moment where you're referring to, it's like when demolding, I put the knife and the blades under the part just to get my wedge under it to, to make it pop out of the mold. Um, so it's a flange, so I don't mind having some scratches onto the, onto the flange because it will be trimmed at the end. So uh, that's not a big deal. If you're referring to removing like the backing of the pre prick if you're very careful, it's very okay to do because you just pinch your knife into the, um, the blue backing layer and you just lift it off and then there's no problem using um, a standing knife or a razor blade on there. So in the last video, I also asked to add some comments about what I should do with that shape. Uh, beach and boards, thanks for the, the good idea of making a, a cereal bowl from it. The only downside is that it's, it wouldn't stand still onto the table. Uh, but like I've showed you, Here's a cereal bowl, so uh, if you want some cornflakes, you can just put it in here. I do it, so um, 
About pre-break or infusion, like I said in this video, uh, it's very hard to make the comparison and I think it would take way too much time just to make like a good comparison between the two. Um, but just to keep it short, um, the size of the mold will make a difference. So if you're making small parts, go for pre-break. If you're making big parts, for example, boats, um, things that I would say over 50 on 50 centimeters big, I would directly go for uh, infusion because it's cheaper and it's sometimes faster. And um, yeah, if, if it's not like strength wise, if you're not making uh, I rose base and planes and things like that, or parts that are of some big import importance of a structural point of view, then I will always go for infusion because I like the, the system of infusion as well. Pre-break is more like for small pieces or big batches where everything has to be like the same layup um, the same alignment of fibers um, and things like that. So I hope it, this answers your question as well. So Tony Webster about getting airtight vacuum bags. Like I said in the video, it's, it's very hard to explain it or just to show it. It's just a matter of, of making a lot of bags. I think throughout the years I've been making 400 bags and then you just get better and better. In the beginning I thought it was impossible to make like an airtight seal because I thought it was just like something that happened in videos and then just say, yes, this is an airtight bag and it's, it's, uh, it's leak free and blah, blah, blah. I thought it was not possible because I was always making like the, the same mistakes. Like most common mistakes are having loose strands under like the tacky tape, making a bridge between the open air and your bag or, um, just creases into your uh, tacky tape or into your bag. Um, and it's mostly like, how do you know if you have an airtight seal? Like you mentioned, uh, the, big, um, the big gaps, you can hear them from um, the vacuum being pulled through and you just hear it. The small leaks cannot be found. What's the solution? Uh, just doing a drop test for over two or three hours. And if the bag is still fully under vacuum, then you're pretty sure that you have a good bag. Um, but I think I'll go through, I'll try to explain it, but it's very difficult to do into a full video and just go through the misconceptions about uh, not having an airtight, airtight sealed bag or um, having some voids into your bag and so on. I hope this answers your question as well. Stefano, so about getting the alignment of the fibers in a good way, like you were talking about the dry fibers. Um, because with the pre-prick, it will, it will be very easy to get, to get the alignment correctly. Uh, but with dry fibers, it's like mostly just being gentle to the carbon fiber. Um, a 12K will also be easier to keep tightly into the weave than a 3K uh, carbon fiber. So that might be a solution. And it's like mostly making good cuts, having a clean table, not having some punctures into the bag or dust or debris that if you pull the carbon fiber, you will just stretch the fibers and so on. So um, that's the way of doing it. And I, it's very hard to explain. I think it's just like a matter of no, knowing how to use it and just being gentle to, uh, to the carbon fiber. So Weldon Warren about the reusable vacuum bag that you're asked for and it's probably one of the most asked question uh, on my YouTube channel, especially with the rowing boat uh, tutorial that I did, uh, the rowing seat. Um, so I just buy them, buy them locally. So it's, it's something just like you see you, when you have pillows or things like that, you can just store them and you can just pull the air out with, the, with a vacuum cleaner. Um, would I recommend buying these? Uh, maybe yes, maybe not. Like, especially for pre-break, definitely don't use them because the plastic is not heat resistant. Secondly, you will get leaks. So um, I was okay with it in the past, but now I always go to uh, simple vacuum bags, tacky tape, just to get good results. Uh, it's good for debulking, even though it's better to have a sealed, completely sealed bag. Um, it's just sometimes when it has to go quickly, you're okay with it. 
Um, otherwise, I would always suggest you to go with the simple vacuum bagging system. So I hope this answers, I think, many questions of uh, many people on my YouTube channel. So that's it for this video. So I hope you liked it. Uh, I try to answer like as much questions or um, mysteries around prepreg. So it took me quite a lot of time to make this video. It's a very long video as well, I know. I hope it's okay for most of you to have long videos. Would you like to have them like maybe shorter or um, separated in several parts? Just let me know in the comments below. If you like this type of series, uh, give this video a thumbs up as well, because I think I'll do more videos uh, like this, like comparing polyester resin with epoxy resin, comparing different uh, infusion meshes, different vacuum bagging um, bags, tacky tapes, uh, resin connectors, um, like vacuum connectors as well, vacuum pumps, uh, everything concerning uh, a broader uh, package around composites. If you would like to see more of these, let me know. The idea is to make, um, to go from one video a week to two videos a week, where one video will be a project video and the other video will be more like an, um, an informal video about um, composites in general. So let me know if you would like something like this. Uh, don't forget to hit that like button, share that video with as many friends as you can. And um, yeah, don't forget to subscribe as well. So thanks for watching and see you guys in the next video.